Hi everyone, I hope all of you are doing good. Thank you very much for signing up to this D3.js course. So what is D3? D3 is an open source JavaScript library. This library may be used to create visual representations of your data. This means that you can create DOM elements using your data. These DOM elements may be simple HTML elements like headings, paragraphs, buttons, or they may include sophisticated charts and graphs as well. D3 makes use of HTML, CSS, and SVG to create those representations. And as you know that these are the technologies of web, so whatever you create using D3, you can view on any modern browser like Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Internet Explorer. This course consists of 10 screencasts, and I've tried to keep each screencast short and simple. I'll be explaining fundamental concepts of D3 with the help of simple and interesting examples. To learn more about D3, there are many good resources available online. The official documentation of D3.js is also very helpful in this regard. There are also lots of blogs available about D3 on different platforms like Medium. Here I've included the links of a couple of blogs. First blog was written by me, and the other one was written by Per Herald, who is also the co-creator of this tool, Scrimba. So who am I? I am Soheb Nihal. I'm a full-stack JavaScript developer. I love traveling, reading, and making new friends. You can connect me via Twitter. My handle is given below. I hope you would enjoy this course. Thank you again for joining in. Let's get started. Hi there. In this lesson, we'll be learning some basic techniques to do DOM selection and manipulation using D3.js. In our HTML file, as you can see that we have an H1 tag and a couple of script tags. The first script tag is loading D3.js library from its official link. The other script tag is loading the JavaScript file in which we'll be writing all of our D3.js code. Using D3, we can select DOM elements using their CSS selectors or the name of element itself. D3 provides us two methods to select DOM elements. They are D3.select and D3.selectAll. Both of these methods accept a CSS selector or the name of DOM element as a parameter and return selection of the element. D3.select method returns the first selection of DOM element matching the criteria, while D3.select all returns all the elements matching the criteria. For example, if we want to select our heading tag, we can call D3.select h1. This will look into the DOM and return us the first h1 tag it finds. If there is no H1 tag inside the DOM, it will return an empty selection. Using D3, we can manipulate a DOM elements as well, which means we can update their style, values, or bind data with them. For example, we can apply some style to our H1 tag using dot style method. We can give it a color, give it a save, and see that the color of our heading has been updated. In D3, we can chain methods with each other as well so that it helps keeping the code clean and easy to read. Using .attr method, we can apply different attributes to our selected element, for example, adding a class or ID to it. We can also update the text of our selected element using .text method. If we want to append DOM elements, we can use .append method. For example, we can select our body element here and append a paragraph tag. We give it a text of first paragraph. We give it a save and see that the paragraph has been appended to our DOM. Let's add a couple of more paragraphs. 
We give it a save and see that now we have three paragraphs inside a DOM. Let's select all of these paragraphs using D3 dot select all. And give it a style of color blue. We give it a save and see that the color of our paragraph tags have been updated to blue. In the next lesson, we will be learning some techniques about data loading and binding using d3.js. Thank you for watching. Hi there. In the previous lesson, we learned about DOM selection and manipulation using d3.js. It is time to introduce some data into the scene. Using D3, we can map data into our DOM elements, meaning we can append, update, or display DOM elements using our data set. In our example, we have an array of some numbers. What we are trying to do here is to create paragraph tags for each data item in the array. We first of all select our body element using select method, and afterwards we select all the paragraph tags inside it. Since we do not have any paragraph tags yet, it will return an empty selection. Now we call dot data method and pass it our dataset as an argument. This method will put data into the waiting state for further processing. We then call dot enter method. This method will take data items one by one and perform further operations on them. For each data item, we are appending a paragraph tag and binding some dummy text inside it. Let's give it a save and see what appears on the DOM. As you can see, there are five paragraph tags have been appended into our DOM. Each paragraph tag represents the data item in our data set. We can also update the text of our paragraphs to show the value of data item by passing it a function inside the dot text method. This function will be getting the value of data item in its parameter, which we can return from it. Now you see that our paragraphs are displaying the value of data item inside it. In the next lesson, we'll be learning how to create a bar chart using d3.js. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this lesson, we'll be learning how to create a simple bar chart. In our HTML file, we have an SVG tag. In our JavaScript file, we have our data set, which we will be using to create the bar chart. We have variables defined for the width and height of SVG container and the padding between the bars. We calculate the width of each bar by dividing the total width of SVG container with the total number of elements in our data set. Below that, we select our SVG container and give it the attribute of width and height. Next, we will create our bar chart. To create a bar chart, we can make use of the fact that bars are nothing but rectangles. So first of all, we select all the rectangles by using select all method. Since we do not have any rectangles in our SVG so far, this will return an empty selection. Afterwards, we call the data method and provide it our data set. This method would take our data set into the waiting state. Afterwards, we call an enter method. This enter method will take our data set from the waiting state and perform further operations. This enter method takes the data from the waiting state and perform next operations on each data item. So for example, it will call all these methods for 80, 100, 56, and rest of the data items. For each data item, we are appending a rectangle inside our SVG container. We provide the attribute of Y, height, width, and transform to each of the rectangle. To give the Y attribute, we call the attribute method. This takes a function which gets the data in its parameter. We calculate the y attribute by subtracting the data item with the SVG height. The next attribute we set is height. We return the data value from the callback function. 
Afterwards, we provide width to our bar chart. For this, we subtract bar padding from the bar width we calculated in the beginning. In the end, we apply the transformation of translate to our bar chart. So D3 provides us with a lot of options to transform any object. Here we are using the translation kind of transform for our rectangles. So we do not want our bars to start from the same position. Therefore, we would want to translate them one after another. And this is what we are doing over here in this function. In this step, we calculate the value of translation for our bars. So as you can see that there are two values in this translate array. One is the amount of translation on x-axis and another one on y-axis. Since we are translating each rectangle one after another, therefore we calculate the value by multiplying the index with the bar width. In the end, we return the translate string with the value of translation which we calculated above. When we give it a save, we can see that our bar chart has been appended inside our DOM. Thank you very much for watching. Hi there. In the previous lesson, we learned how to create a bar chart using d3.js. We use the array of numbers as our dataset to create a bar chart. In this lesson, we will be applying labels to our bar chart. Since labels are text, therefore, we'll be appending a text element for each data item on top of each bar. Like we added rectangles for our bar chart in the previous example, we'll be adding text element for each data item. For this, let's first of all select all the text element inside our SVG. Since we have no text element so far, this will return an empty selection. Afterwards, we introduce a dataset using data method and get in enter mode using dot enter method. This will bring in data items one by one for further processing. We want to append text for each data item and want to keep its value to be the number itself. Using text method, we can get the value of our data item. Text method either takes a string or a function as a parameter. The function gets the data value in its parameter, which we can return from inside it. Afterwards, we give the y attribute like we did with our rectangles above. The only difference is that we want our text to be slightly higher than our bar. And that is why we are subtracting two more pixels from it. We give the x attribute to be the starting point of each rectangle. And we get it by using the values of bar width and index of the data element. In the end, we give text element some color by using the fill attribute. We give it a save and see that labels have been appended on top of each bar. In the next lesson, we will learn how to create scales into our charts. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone. In this lesson, we'll be using the same examples as we used in our previous two lessons about creating bar chart and adding labels to them. We now will be introducing a rather advanced topic, which is about using scales for our data. So what are scales? Scales are functions which will transform your data by either increasing or decreasing their values for better visualizations. So far, our bar chart looks like this. What if we update the data set and introduce much smaller values? Hmm. So our bars are hardly visible now. This is because the values which we are using are much smaller. In the scenarios like these, we can make use of the scales. Here we have created a variable by the name of y scale and we are calling the function of d3.scale linear. We will then change the method of dot domain which will take an array as an argument. This array contains two elements. First one is zero and another one is the maximum number in our data set. We can calculate this number by using d3.max function. Then we also change the method of dot range, which will keep the scaled values inside the range of our SVG container. It also takes an array of which the first element is zero, and the second element is the height of our SVG container. 
Now we finally parse the values of our y coordinate and the height of the rectangle using y scale method. And we give it a save. Our bars now have been properly scaled for the visual representations. In the next lesson, we'll learn how to create axes inside our charts. Thank you for watching. Hi guys, welcome back to another tutorial. In this lesson, we'll be learning about the concept of axes in D3.js. As you know that axes are an integral part of any chart or a graph. Axes are made of lines, ticks, and text. You can imagine how complicated it would be to create all three of them separately. But thankfully, D3 provides us a very simple API to create axes for our charts. D3 provides us four significant methods to create axes. They are D3.axis top, axis right, axis bottom, and axis left. Let's learn from a simple example how to create X and Y axes for our chart. After selecting our SVG element and providing it with the attributes of width and height, we move towards creating scales for our axes. We'll be using linear functions to create our scales. We have created scales exactly like this in our previous lessons as well. So let's move forward. Moving forward, now we actually create our axes. As I mentioned earlier, D3 provides us a very simple API to create axes. For our x axis, we'll be calling D3.axis bottom. This will return a function which we are going to chain with another function of a scale and provide it our x scale. Similarly, to create a y axis, we call D3.axis left and then chain it with a scale function and provide it the y scale. Afterwards, we append a group element inside our SVG element and provide it the attribute of translate transformation and then we call y axis on this group element. Afterwards, we append another group element inside our SVG container and provide it the translate transformation attribute. In the end, we call x axis on this group element. Let's give it a save and we can see that our axes have been appended inside our DOM. We can see that our axes have lines, ticks, and text as well, and it was all created just using the access methods provided by D3. Thank you very much for watching. Hi there, welcome to another lesson of our D3.js course. In this lesson, we'll be learning how to create different SVG elements using D3. As always, in our HTML file, we have an SVG tag and a script tags to load d3.js library and a JavaScript file where we write all of our code. SVG or Scalable Vector Graphics is a powerful tool to define vector graphics for the web. Using SVG, we can create different shapes and apply different styles to them. Since it's a vector graphic, we can scale them as much as we want without getting them distorted. In our JavaScript file, we first of all select our SVG element using d3.select and give it the attribute of width and height. We also give it the attribute of class of SVG container, which we have defined in our CSS file. To create a line using SVG, we need coordinates of a starting and ending point of a line. Starting coordinates would be x1, y1, while ending coordinates would be x2, y2. These should be the coordinates inside our SVG element. We also give it the attribute of a stroke and the stroke will take the name of any color. We give it a save and see that the line has been rendered inside our SVG container. If we want to make our line slightly thicker, we can give it the attribute of a stroke width. It takes a number and we see that a line has become a little bit thicker. Now let's create a rectangle. To create a rectangle, we need to provide X and Y coordinates, which will be the beginning point of our rectangle. We also need to provide it the attribute of width and height. If we save and refresh, we can see that rectangle has also been rendered inside our SVG container. It appears purple, because we have given it the attribute of fill with the hash of a color. 
To create a circle using d3.js, we need to provide the coordinates of center of the circle. These coordinates would be cx and cy. Also, we need to provide the radius of our circle. Radius is a distance from center of a circle to any point on the boundary of a circle. Like rectangle, we can also give it the attribute of fill if we want to apply any color inside it. Now we can see that all of our SVG elements, circle, rectangle, and line have been appended inside our SVG container. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone. In this lesson, we'll be creating a pie chart using d3.js. We'll be displaying the market share of top three operating systems in our pie chart. In our JavaScript file, we have our data set, which is a collection of objects in which each object contains the name of the platform and its percentage share. We first of all select our SVG element and give it the attribute of width and height. Then we move on to creating a group element inside our SVG container. This group element will hold our pie chart. After appending the group element, we transform it by translating it to the center of our SVG container. Then we select the range of colors provided by the built-in method of D3. We will be using this function to provide colors to the pies of our chart. To prepare our data to be compatible with drawing pie chart, we pass it through d3.py method. Since we want to use the attribute of percentage from a data set to create pies, we pass a callback function to d3.py and return the percentage attribute. Now we call a d3.arc method, which will create path elements using the arc data. We chain outer radius and inner radius method, which will define the boundaries of those arcs. Hello everyone, in this last lesson of our d3.js course, we'll be learning how to create a line chart. We'll be using a real-time data of Bitcoin price index of past four months. We'll be fetching the data from an external API and at the end of this lesson, we'll be able to create a line chart like this. So let's get started. In our JavaScript file, we have an API which will be fetching the data of Bitcoin price index of past four months. Below that, we have an event listener which gets fired once the DOM has been loaded. In this event listener, we are fetching the data using the API we declared at the beginning. Once we have this data, we pass it to another function which converts this data into the form which is suitable to create line chart. This function makes an array of objects in which each object contains date and the price of Bitcoin on that particular date. Once the data has been parsed, we call another function. We name this function draw chart and pass it our data. This function would be responsible to create the line chart. In this draw chart function, we are getting a data set in its parameters. Afterwards, we have defined some variables to calculate the width and height of the chart. In the next step, we select our SVG element like always and provide it the attributes of width and height. Then we append a group tag inside our SVG element. We use attribute method to apply transformation as an attribute to this group element. Even though transform can accept multiple types of options, here we are keeping it to translation transform, which actually pushes the group over and down by the amount we are providing over here. Then we create scales for our line chart. Since we'll be displaying the price index of Bitcoin over the period of past few months, it makes sense to display the time duration on the x-axis. D3 provides us a function of a scale time to create such kind of a scales. For our y-axis though, it makes sense to keep the scale linear since we are just showing the price of Bitcoin on that axis. In the next step, we'll create the line chart. We'll use the function of d3.line. This function returns another function which creates the line. Next, we will change this method to another function which will set its x-attribute. Dot x method takes an anonymous function which gets past the data. We'll be returning the attribute of date for our x attribute. Please notice that we are passing the value of date through our scale method which we have defined above. Similarly, we will change the dot y function to set the y attribute. We'll be returning the attribute of value of Bitcoin from this method after passing it through the y scale function. The domain function here is designed to let D3 know about the scope of the data when it is passed to scale function. 
If we look at x.domain, here we are using extend method to let D3 know about the scope of the data. Extend method takes an anonymous function which returns data value and in the end, it returns minimum and maximum value of the dates. Similar things happen with y.domain method in which it returns the minimum and maximum value. This value would be used to create the scales properly. We then append a group element inside our parent group and apply some transformations to it. Then we pass a d3.access bottom function to call method. When we are using the call function over here, we are actually calling d3.access bottom on our newly created group element. We then select any classes of domain and remove it. Moving forward, we append another group element inside our parent group and we call the method of d3.access and left y on it. Afterwards, we append some text and pass them the attributes of fill, transform, and some of the coordinates as well. This block of code would basically generate the y axis. In the end, we append a path inside our parent group element. This path would be the line which we see in the line chart. To create this path, we call the method of datum and we pass a dataset. We apply some more attributes like fill, stroke, stroke width and provide them the appropriate values. And then in the end, we apply the attribute of D and we pass our line function over here. This line function would basically be creating the line for that D attribute. In the end, we give it a save. And here you can see that our line chart has been appended inside our DOM. Congratulations, you have now completed the course and have the basic understanding of D3.js. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter or in the Q&A section. Also, if you enjoyed this course, I would appreciate if you would share it. Here is the link, so feel free to, for example, email it to someone you know or share it on Facebook or Twitter. Thank you very much again for watching and good luck with the coding.